Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Bob. I am alcoholic. Just had a deja vu moment. Uh, I'm... <laughs> Uh, through God's grace that I've accessed in the program and fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous, good sponsorship, 12 steps, lots of commitments and meetings. I haven't had a drink or any mind or emotion altering substances since Halloween 1978. And for that, I owe you my life. Um, uh, I am... <laughs> I think I'm delighted to be here. I don't know. I'm supposed to say that. Uh, actually, I am. There's a, a lot of people here I know. And I was sitting here thinking what, that in this room tonight, I was looking around and I was seeing a tremendous amount of examples of Alcoholics Anonymous in this room. And there's a lot of real doers here. There's a lot of people that uh, spend a lot of time try, but trying to help other alcoholics that are really involved in the fellowship. And uh, sometimes I just, I, I can't believe that I'm part of an organization that is that at times other centered, even though the basic membership is self centered. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you in a general way what I used to be like, what happened, and what I'm like now. I, I suspect that I had alcoholism possibly before I ever picked up a drink. I was like a freeze-dried alcoholic waiting for alcohol. And I, I was not quite right before I ever picked up a drink. There was something about me that I just didn't feel like other people looked. I didn't seem to fit with the ease and that other people seemed to fit with each other. I, I seemed to be the guy that was always coming from behind. And I, the first time I ever drank alcohol, I'll tell you something, it made me feel so good that the way I would be without it from that moment on was never enough again for me. And alcohol and the effects and the ease and comfort I'd once found, that I found in taking a few drinks, immediately moved into the center position in my life. And it seemed like from that moment on, I just existed between parties, waiting for the next opportunity to get lit up. And when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, you can't drink every day, but I drank every chance I could get. I'm 15 years old, I'm not even 16 years old, and I'm standing before a juvenile court judge for the third time. And I'm standing before this judge because there's something... I don't understand it, but it seems every time I go out to party, I can't shut it down when you're supposed to. I always go too far. I always get whacked. And I get in trouble a lot. And I, uh, I don't understand that I have alcoholism. I, it never occurred to me. Um, I thought I had bad luck. Uh, I, I, I didn't know that I had what Dr. Silkworth talks about in the doctor's opinion, that allergic reaction to alcohol that only ever occurs in guys like me. And that this allergy manifests itself in a phenomenon of craving. I never knew I had that. And I, uh, I got to tell you, I had that from day one. I look back over my drinking and, and I can't tell you one moment ever in all those years where I was ever partying for an hour or so, maybe sitting in a bar somewhere, have the bartender come by after I've been drinking for a while and say, Bob, would you like another drink? I have never once sat there and honestly thought to myself, nah, this is just right. <laughs> not once, not once. It's always one more, one more, one more. And it seemed like I could never really ever get enough. I could never get to the point where, I could, yeah, this is good. It's always one more, one more. And so if you're like that and you have that phenomenon of craving that every drink I ever take makes me basically feel like I want to have another drink, then you're destined to get whacked a lot and go too far. 
And I didn't know that I had that deal. I, I just, I'm at this standing before this juvenile court judge. I'm not even 16 years old. I just know I'm in a lot of trouble. My parents, who loved me dearly, they were not alcoholics. I didn't come from an alcoholic home. I was loved as a child. I had a great childhood. And my parents, who loved me very much, were at the very end of their rope trying to help me and get me out of scrapes. And I got sent, sent to this place, and I... Uh, I, where I was to live for a while, and I, I, I'm not even there a week. And I'm sitting with this guy, and we're talking, and he, I'm telling him about me and how I'm in trouble and what had happened to me and how I got busted again and on and on and on. And he says to me, he says, well, you like to party, don't you? I said, yeah, I'm telling you, I like to party. He said, but you drink that liquor. That'd make you stupid. Oh, I don't know. I just like to party. He says, what if I told you? that I had something that make you feel as good as that, maybe better. You can't smell it on your breath, does not make you stagger, nobody can tell you're screwed up, and you can keep a whole week's supply in your shirt pocket. What would you say to that? Sign me up. And he introduced me to drugs, and i got to tell you something, I'm a real alcoholic, and real alcoholics shouldn't do drugs, we're pigs. And I did my little dance of death with drugs was several years, and I'll tell you everything I ever picked up. I did it alcoholically. I took it to the wall. I, some guy introduced me to, to amphetamines. I started shoot, shooting speed for a little while. And in no time at all, I'm the guy that's so whacked that if you left me alone in your car, by the time you came back, I've dismantled your radio looking for microphones from the FBI, right? And I got to the end of that rope, and that's and some guy came along. By this time, I've turned myself into a paranoid schizophrenic. I, I can't even put coherent sentences together because I'm spinning so much in my head. And a guy came along, he said, try some of this. He introduced me to heroin, and after the throwing up stopped, I just everything just went, oh. and I could think straight, and I could talk to people again, and I could focus. But I'm an alcoholic. Alcoholics, you know, we I do this stuff alcoholically. And in no, I can't get enough. And in no time at all, I'm, I'm whacked on that. And, I, and eventually, after a few years, I come back to alcohol full circle. And I think that I, my venture into drugs was very similar, to, I think, to what happened to Dr. Bob. In Dr. Bob's story, he did high-powered sedatives every single day of his life for 17 years because when he started to drink, he got so whacked, and yet he can't imagine life without something, so the sedatives bought him periods of time between drunks. And that's pretty much what, that's my story. It's just a bigger couple-year chunk of time. And, um, but I have always had that thing with alcohol. When I start to drink, I just I can't stop. And I, uh, I didn't know that I was in a progressive disease because in the, the first many years, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, people like my parents would, would look at me sometimes aghast, just thinking, why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you, you know, they, I think they one time, they sent me this one psychiatrist. And I remember hearing them talk to the guy. And they were telling him that they thought that I had some kind of self-destructive complex. And it wasn't that at all. But it looks that way to them because I, I'd, get, I'd get sober and I'd get back on my feet and I'd get a good job and maybe a little relationship and I got myself a car and things are looking real good. And just, a, just about the time when, when you, you think Bob's turned the corner... I'd burn my life to the ground one more time. And I, I don't know what's, what that's about. And it must have looked to my parents like I'm like suicidal or something, like I'm self-destructive. To them, it must, I must have looked like a guy who's, who's compelled to fling himself out of a third story window periodically. But what my parents could not see because they could not get inside my skin. I'm not, I'm not singing. What, what my parents could not see is by the time I make the leap, it feels like my life's on fire and the building's on fire and I'm jumping because I can't stand it where I am anymore. 
And so I keep returning back to it, and every time I go back to it, the phenomenon of craving waits for me. And from the moment it's, I start, I can't stop. And, and I did that over and over and over. I, I haven't been paying I haven't been praying for patience. <laughs> really? But somebody here has been and they better cut it out right now. <laughs> That's all right. I got I got a personal apology from the chairman. <laughs> Can you hear me? All right. No? Can you read lips? Why don't you just, why don't you all look at me and make me feel nervous? I've always wondered that. I don't understand the, the psychotherapeutic effect of taking a self-centered person and standing them up in front of a whole bunch of people that are looking at them. I, did, I, I know that there's supposed to be some kind of therapeutic effect in that. I just don't connect the dots sometimes. Should I go on? Can, can you hear me enough to go on or should no? No? All right. How about if I just come and talk from table to table? I'll give each table about two minutes of my story. And <laughs> uh, I could tell my bear story. <laughs> Hello? All right, if I go like this. Really, Mom, it's not lit. <laughs> where'd, that, where'd that come from? Uh, okay. I, I got alcoholism. Uh, I don't know I have alcoholism, but I'm in the early sta- in the early stages of alcoholism. It's a lot of fun. In the early stages of alcoholism, there's a magic about drinking. There's a magic about the effect. I mean, you take a guy like me who normally doesn't fit very good, who I I walk into a party or a bar and I'm locked up in my head and after five or six drinks, I can come out and play. After five or six drinks, I feel integrated and a part of. After several drinks, I start to feel like other people look. When I'm about half lit up, I I can shoot pool better than I can ever shoot pool. I can play the guitar and sing better than I can play the guitar and sing. I can be funny, and I'm not a funny guy. I can be deep. Remember 3 o'clock in the morning and being deep, cracking the secrets of the universe? I'd say crap that just blow my mind. I'd say, whoa, where'd that come from? And then I'd sober up, and I'd be back to being me again. And I never, never liked that much. I'm the, I'm the guy that uh, Robert Louis Stevenson talked about in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. What Dr. Jekyll said, even in the face of all the damage he's done in his life, even in the face of all the harm he's done to people, even in the face of all the shame he has brought on himself, he still liked himself better as, doc- as Mr. Hyde than he ever liked himself as Dr. Jekyll. And that is my dilemma. I had tasted the magic of alcohol. And I, I, I'll tell you something. Sound, this will sound strange to some of you, but I believe this like I believe I'm standing here, that at one time in my life, alcohol and combinations of alcohol and drugs was a, a dynamic and immediate effective treatment for the real secret malady of the spirit called alcoholism. Because a guy like me who doesn't fit, that doesn't do very well in this universe, all of a sudden could get hooked up and connected and be a part of. But alcoholism is a progressive disease. It's, it's, 
And what that means is as the years go on, my ability to recapture that ease and comfort, that fun, that magic, it gets more and more elusive. And I can't, I can't jumpstart the party as effectively as I did at one time. I can't get back all, I'm getting, it's harder and harder to get back to the fun days. And as, as the fun and the ease and comfort's diminishing, the problems are increasing and increasing and increasing. And I started, uh, you know, in the early days of my drinking, I'd go out to, to party. It was almost like spinning a roulette wheel. On that roulette wheel, there was drag racing, there was dancing, there was laughing with the guys, there was shooting pool, there was jam sessions, there, there was getting laid, there was a lot of neat stuff on that wheel. A little bit of throwing up once in a while, a little bit of allocation with the police on occasion. But for the most part, I'd go out to party. I'd spin that wheel and come up party. And then as the disease progressed, it was like some hideous force in the universe started screwing with the wheel and, and taking down certain things and putting up, like, wet pants. And, you know, and that look, you know that look? I, I think most people will go through their whole life and never see that look. It's that look we see all the time from people who loved us. It's that cross between pity and contempt. And we see that a lot. And arrests and jail and institutions and physical sickness and blackouts. Oh man, I had a lot of blackouts. I was a, any blackout drinkers in here to see a, oh yeah, my people. It's hard going through life when other people know more about you than you do. I mean, that's a bad deal. And, I, and, and it, you know, I never, I, I never did anything good in a blackout. No one ever came up to me the next day and said, "Oh, Bob, you were so helpful last night." <sighs> you peed in our kitchen. You hit on my wife. You stole my stash. You broke my lamp. You sideswiped my car. You told everybody at the party you beat Bruce Lee in a karate match. And you know, yeah, they just wait to tell you that, and you hear, they tell you that stuff, and you want to crawl under a rock. You can't believe it. And so now I, I, I start drinking over the things I did when I was drinking. And that is a squirrel cage in itself. They say there's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. Alcoholism of this type is close. Because I'm starting to do things that I'm ashamed of and I'm embarrassed and I can't stand myself for. And as the more of that stuff I do, the harder it is to be sober. And the more frantically I start to drink to blot it out. And I, I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, in an institution. I, I wasn't even old enough to take a legal drink yet. I'm a kid. And I'm in a lot of trouble. And I've ruined my life. And I tell you, I'm in a place where I, I, it, it almost seemed like it, God, it just can't get any worse than this. But alcoholism is a progressive disease. And what happens, you get to those places where you think it can't get any worse than this. And what happens? It gets worse. And then the worst thing of all is it gets the same. And then it's the same thing day after day. Bill Wilson uses a great line as he talks about joining the endless procession of sots. And I was part of that at the last few years of my drinking. It was like that. And, but I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous and I, I don't want what you have. I mean, I don't even want to be at AA. I'm being made to go to the meetings. I, first of all, I mean, you're, <laughs> You're 35 and 40 years old. I mean, your life's over. I'm a young guy. I got the illusion going on that I'm about to get back to the good days. I just had a bad patch of road here. It's going to get better. And I have no idea what it is in store for me. i got to tell you something. The worst, absolute, most horrific, worst years of my life were the years after I came to AA as a chronic relapser, in and out of halfway houses and detoxes, seven and a half years, the worst years of my life. 
And there came in the beginning, I, I got to tell you, the first, my first exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous, first couple years, I suppose, I, I didn't really want what you had. I didn't even really want to be sober. Alcoholics Anonymous and institutions that sent me to AA were like foxholes that I would go in to kind of heal up until things kind of chilled out, cooled out a little bit. And then something started happening to me as the disease progressed and I'm miserable. Now I'm starting to go, now when I drink, it's, I'm not the guy that's laughing and talking to the girls and dancing and ha carrying on having a good time. I started becoming the guy who drinks and feels sorry for himself. I started becoming the guy who drinks and goes on crying jags. I started becoming, I became the guy that doesn't even bathe anymore because I don't care. The days of, of the Aramis and the nice clothes to go out to a bar somewhere, I don't even care anymore. Because once I started to get it that the magic was gone, now the only thing to live for is oblivion. In the last couple years, that's really all I got out of the bottle is I got oblivion. Which ain't so bad if you feel about yourself the way I feel about myself. And if you feel about life the way I feel about life, I'll take oblivion. There's a line in our book, it says that we had to face, we had two choices. One was to go to the, on to the bitter end, blotting out our intolerable situation as best we can, or to accept spiritual help. And I gotta tell you something. I tried alternative number one, and I would have been glad to do it. If I could have just stayed drunk and whacked 24-7 until it finally killed me, I'd have signed up for that. But the problem with alcoholism is whether you want to or not, you're continually forced into states of abstinence. You know, and you're forced to, you know, you run out of money, you get arrested, you get so physically sick, as it used to happen to me all the time, that I can't get it down anymore. It keeps coming up and I'm flying apart. And the seizures and the DTs and all that stuff. And I have to get sober over and over again. And it's, it's wearing on me. I'll tell you, it's a bad deal because now I go out and I burn my life to the ground and I burn it to the ground for nothing. I ain't burning it to the ground because I've been out having fun, laughing and meeting people and being a part of. I'm burning it to the ground seeking oblivion. And I get start, I start trying to do AA and I, I, I go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and I, I, I I, I want to change my life. I want to be different. But I start realizing something in very short order as I started to come to you with a seriousness about my condition. And what I, I started to realize is that I'm not like these people in AA. And it was so clear to me because I stopped drinking and there's something wrong with me. I stop drinking and abstinence feels like I'm doing time. I stop drinking, I, feel, I suffer from low-level depressions, anxiety at times to the point of paralysis or panic. And, and worst of all are those anxious, anxious feelings of apartness, an inability to fit, and I experience that loneliness, sober, that is just awful. It's the kind of loneliness that, you, that I, I would get it sitting in the middle of an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting with a feeling like it's all of you, and then there's me. And I would do this time sober, and I wouldn't drink day in and day out and week in and week out until I just get it up to here. And I'll tell you, if you're an alcoholic of my type, with untreated alcoholism, without some sort of transformation in, in thought and actions and feelings that it talks about in the spiritual deal in the back of the book, without that in my life, the question is not if I will drink again. The question is when. It's an absolute inevitability for an alcoholic of my type to drink again with untreated alcoholism, no matter how much I swear to myself I will never touch that again, no matter how great my resolve is to not drink. This vacancy, this emptiness in the core of my being 
in this loneliness and low-level depression just gradually grinds away my resolve until after till one day after many months or weeks or after when I get to the end of the string, wherever that may be, I got a screw it switch in my head. And the screw it switch goes and I can't think of anything else at that moment except this, this deluded thought about the fun I could have if I just go get lit up. And the reason it's a delusion is that the truth, the reality is, it has, I haven't drank like I drank when I was 18 and 20 years old for years. I'm in that pathetic stage of alcoholism. And yet, I'll tell you, every time I drank again after a period of abstinence, I did it driven by a fantasy up against the backdrop of my own vacancy and the fantasies I'm going to get like I was when I was 18, 20 years old again. And I ignore reality. And the reality is I haven't, I haven't been able to drink like that for years. But reality doesn't interfere with me at all. I mean, I really... <laughs> Reality doesn't. I, I got that delusion, that psychotic, wishful thinking. All I have to do is want something to be a certain way bad enough that after a while, oh, it's that way. And then I drink again and I... Phenomenon of craving kicks in and I did this for years. One time I was in a, a treatment center, a halfway house, and the, the, one of the head counselors there, he, I guess he felt sorry for me or something. I don't know. He... You know, he asked me one time, he said, what's wrong with you? And I sat there, and I don't know what to do. He like, beats the hell out of me. I don't know. It's not that anything in particular is wrong. It's just that nothing's right. I'm restless. I'm irritable. I'm discontent. Why? I don't have a clue. I just feel like a fish out of water. I just ain't right. I don't know. I just, I, I, and he, I looked, I guess I looked depressed. So he, he sent me to a psychiatrist. And I remember go, going to this guy's office and the, the state was paying for it. And I'm going to this, uh, this mental health, mental retardation center to see this psychiatrist. And I don't know which half I was, but I'm going to the deal. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to be honest with this guy. Maybe he can help me. And I went in and I, I started telling him about how I felt and the difficulties I had fitting. And, and I'm working in this job with these, in a painting crew, painting this school district with a bunch of guys. And, and they're, and they all, and they don't, they treat me badly. You know, they're always goofing on me. And, and I, it's like when I get sober, it's like I've had my sense of humor surgically removed. You know what I mean? It's, there's nothing funny in my life. And, and these guys are carrying on and they're, and they don't, they, they kind of reject me. At least it feels that way. And, and I'm telling him about that. And I'm telling him about the, the problems I have with the other people in the, in the place I'm living and all this stuff. And, and he says to me, he says, you know, those people you work with, they don't really appreciate what you're trying to do with this not drinking thing. I thought, boy, this guy's a good psychiatrist. I kind of warmed up to him a little bit, and he, he said, there's no reason you should feel that way. I thought, yeah. He said, we got medications for guys just like you. And he reached over and he grabbed his prescription pad, and I started to feel better immediately. I'm telling you, if I could have ran around his desk and hugged him, I would have. And he gave me something, he told, he told me what it would do, and it did exactly what he told me it would do. And it did take the extremes off my emotions. And it took the edge off of the way I felt. And with the extremes in my emotions and with some of the depression and anxiety also went the desperation. Now I'm not here to tell you that I can, I could tell you for sure that if I wouldn't have got on that stuff that maybe I would have I would have had a breakdown in, in abstinence and surrendered and got a sponsor and started working those steps and got a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if that would have happened. But I know one thing for sure. It kind of made me gave me this false sense of security, like I was okay. And the problem is it did give me a little bit of relief from my emotions. But I'll tell you how the kind of guy I am, I, when the hell's a little bit of relief ever been enough for a guy like me? And it just started a slow burn and a slow yearning. And all of a sudden, I'm back 
doing what I really yearn to do. I'm back drinking alcohol again. And the phenomenon of craving kicks in and I just one more time ruin my life. And I did that and did that. And I, I, try, I tried religion. And I don't like religion, but you get desperate enough, you'll try some weird stuff. I mean, I went to some seminars. I, I really liked therapy because it was, I, get, I, loved, I didn't like groups so much as I liked one-on-one -on -one because we could make it all about my favorite subject, me. And I, I remember going to, one time I went to this weekend uh, therapeutic retreat where they wouldn't let you sleep and you're up round the clock the whole weekend emoting and talking about your feelings. And I'll tell you something, it changed my life for two weeks. <laughs> and no matter what I did, no matter what fix I got, it would oh, the shine of it would wear off and I'd always be back to being me again. And who that is, is it's the guy that doesn't fit. The guy that's just locked up in here. The guy that's, that doesn't do abstinence very well. In 1977, by 1977, I had given up on Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I knew that whatever's wrong with you, Kent, is not the same thing that's wrong with me. Because you stopped drinking and you're, you're wonderful. I always liked you. You were always very kind to me. But I stopped drinking and I don't feel at all like you feel. And, and ex you guys are doing great. And I'm not. And so I gave up on Alcoholics Anonymous. I kept ending up there, but I gave up on it. And I, I'm, I'm in this halfway house and I, I'm sober, uh, not a year, but 10 months, maybe. I don't know why I didn't keep track. But it was a long time for a guy suffering with untreated alcoholism. A long time for a guy who's just got his life and his emotions kind of on him. And I'm, my spirit is smothering and depressed because I got me on me and I'm just smothering me with me. And it's bad. And I, I go on uh, this drunk, I plan it. And uh, if you're new and you're thinking about drinking again, I mean, you ought to plan it. I mean, not that it won't help, but it gives you a false sense of security going into it. And I just plan, I'm gonna, I got a weekend pass out of this place, and I'm gonna, I'm, the guy I was in detox with is back to drinking. I'm going to go down there, going to party all Friday night, all day Saturday, Sunday morning, going to shut it down, get back to the halfway house so I don't lose my place to live. Seemed like a reasonable plan. But I'm still a victim of an illusion that I can control and enjoy my drinking, that I can enjoy it, that I can get jumpstart the party and get back to it, even though I had done that in a while, and that I'll be able to control it enough to keep the damage down to something reasonable. I started that drunk, and I remember the phenomenon of craving hit me. It hit me. I was drinking double shots, 100 proof Southern Comfort. Because when you only got a weekend, you got to get downtown now. <laughs> and I got beer backs, and I'm throwing them down. I'm throwing. I want to jumpstart the deal. I, I want to. Man, I got. I've been sober a long time. I got. I just want to have some fun. I don't want to ruin my life. I don't want any problems. I just want to have some fun. The loneliness is overwhelming. And I can't jumpstart the party. I remember sitting at that bar. There's a band in this one room, and guys shooting pool, and people carrying on and having a good time, and I remember watching them have a good time and wondering, what's wrong with me? Because I could remember when I was all about all of that. But I can't get it back. Then I drank myself. I got some amphetamines because when you only have a weekend, you don't want to miss nothing. And I <clears throat> drank all night long, all night long, all day next day, all wait, late Saturday night. Go back to this guy's house. I'm supposed to crash on the, on his couch and, and he goes to sleep, and I'll tell you the kind of alcoholic I am, if I'm still conscious, I ain't done drinking. But I'm out of money. And he left his car keys and his wallet on the counter in the kitchen, and I, I'm not a thief, but I do know when a loan's appropriate. And I, I borrowed his car keys and a little bit of money out of his wallet, and I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do anything bad. I'm going to go down here to the bar. It's going to close pretty soon. It's almost 2 a.m. I'm going to get... I'm going to get a couple double shots real quick, six pack of malt liquor, come back there so I can put myself to sleep. 
Because that's I don't go to sleep when I start drinking. i got to put myself to sleep. The next thing I know, I've come to in a county jail, facing two years or more in a state penitentiary for a hit-and-run DUI in a stolen car. They gave me phone calls, and there wasn't a person on the face of the earth to call. The book says, we'll know a loneliness such as few do. And I don't know what had happened to me. I was the guy that was very popular in high school. I was the guy that had a lot of friends at one time. I was the guy who had a family that would have done anything for me. And I had burnt them all out and used them all up. And I was totally alone and there's no one that will help me or take my calls. So I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in the county jail. And I'm not going to the meeting for recovery. I'm going for cigarettes. And I also, in the back of my mind, I got a little auxiliary plan. I knew that from my experience in AA, there's some of those people in AA who owned big houses and had a lot of money, a little influence. I, you never know. Maybe I'd con one of these guys into getting me out on bail or something. You never, you always get me thinking. And I go to that meeting and I'm, I'm sitting in this room waiting for the do-gooders from AA to come in. You know, they always come in. Here they come. You know, the, and here, leading the pack of do-gooders is a guy named Woody. And I know Woody. Woody used to bring meetings into the treatment center I was in the year before. He brought meetings into the one I was just in. And he brought meetings into the detox. I know Woody. I don't like Woody. <laughs> Woody's, one of the, Woody's one of those happy, grateful, loving God talking about the steps. I'm always glad to see you smile. He's, he's, he's happy and sober. How do you do that? Uh, you got And he, he used to come into the, into the halfway houses and go on for 10 minutes about how wonderful his life is. I used to sit there and think, what if I'd gone to hell? I mean, isn't it bad enough that I burnt my life to the ground? I have to sit here and listen to him tell me how wonderful his is. So here comes Woody. Now, I, I can barely tolerate Woody on a good day, and this is not a good day. <laughs> and here he comes. You know, he's all teeth and eyes and hands and, you know, all that stuff. You know, they, you know how they do? Oh, they're intrusive people. He comes up, and I shake his hand, and I... I'm a mope. You know, I'm a mope. You know, it's, how you doing? Uh, I'm sorry I let you guys down in AA. Like I imagined Alcoholics Anonymous has gone into mourning since I drank. I don't <laughs> And I started telling him about, I started telling him about my situation. And I'm trying to, I know he has a big house. And I'm trying to maneuver him into putting his house up for bail so I can get out of jail. And he won't do it. He wants, he, does, he wants to get me a big book. I mean, I don't want a big book. I want out of here. You know, these people, hey, they'll tell you they want to help you until you explain it to them. And then they don't want to go along. So he won't get me out on bail. And I start telling him, I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to beat this thing. I'll get out. I'm going to beat this. I'm going to get in a good halfway house. Not like that one that took advantage of me. I'm going to get in a good one. I'm going to get some of that voc rehab government money. I'm going to go to school. Maybe I'll be a doctor. Maybe I'll be an attorney. I'm going to make something myself. And Woody looks at me and he's shaking his head and he says, Kid, you're not going to do nothing. You're not even going to stay sober. Kid, you haven't hit a bottom. You haven't surrendered. Kid, you don't have a chance. And I'll tell you something, he really pissed me off. I, 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 but I don't, I don't do confrontation well sober. So I didn't say nothing to him. I sat down in that meeting and I'm just thinking at him. Do you ever just think at people? What I'm thinking at him, I'm thinking, how dare you say that to me? That's the most negative thing I've ever heard. I don't need that negativity. I need positive reinforcement here. Negative. <laughs> Haven't hit a bottom. You don't know nothing about me, Woody. You're with your Cadillac, your big house, and your wife, and your kids, and your manager job at the steel mill. You don't know nothing about me. Surrender. <laughs> Surrender what? There's nothing left of me. There's nothing to give up. And Woody knew something about me I didn't know. That I, he, what, what he saw when he looked at me, I tell you, I've seen this 
And I bet you 500 guys in West Care and in the county jail over the years, and I, I go to a lot of those meetings because I go there looking for me. And what, what he saw when he looked at, at me is the same thing I see. So I saw a guy who has destroyed himself, who's dying of alcoholism, and yet insisting at being at the wheel of his own life. In, in, in spite of overwhelming experience and information, that that's not good. You know, I, I mean, if you would have followed me around the last two years I was drinking and watched me, you would easily come to the conclusion that whoever's making decisions for this guy is out to kill him. <laughs> but in here, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. And I went, to, I got out of that county jail by going to, in front of a judge who sentenced me to two years in a state penitentiary and then stayed the commitment, cut me a break. He said, if you can do all the things I ask you to do with the PO reports and the restitution and the good UAs for a year, we'll reduce this to a misdemeanor and you'll be, uh, you'll be okay. But if you can't do all that stuff, you're going to do some time. So I went into this place called the Ark House. It's not really a treatment center. It's like the bottom of the food chain for, for recovery, really. It's a place that houses a couple hundred homeless guys and guys out of prison. And I went into this place with a determination never to drink again. And this time I meant it. I'm telling you, I meant it with everything in me. But I'm the guy it talks about in the big book when it says lack of power, that is our dilemma. No matter how tremendous my resolve is, I don't have the power to carry it out. Alcoholism always wins with me. Unless I find a power greater than myself, I don't have a shot. And after several months in that place of not drinking, I couldn't take it anymore. I just was so depressed and so lonely. And I, I went on my last run, and I didn't know it was to be my last run. And on that run, I tried to commit suicide. I, I went to a bridge with my bottle of Richard's Wild Irish Rose, and I'm, I'm pathetic, and I'm dirty, and I'm chronic crying jag, and, I'm, and I feel sorry for myself, and I'm going there because I want this to stop. And I'm not a suicidal guy by nature, but I'll tell you something about me. You put me in a trap I can't spring. You put me in a place where drinking is awful and pathetic and pitiful. And not drinking is depressing and vacant and lonely. And drinking is terrible and not drinking is terrible. Suicide can start looking like a good deal to a guy like me. But I've always been a coward and at the last moment when it's time to make the leap, I, I break down, I start sobbing and I screw my hand up, smashing it on this piece of metal on that bridge and cursing myself for being a coward. And little did I know that I was about to enter into the only really good life I've ever known. I came off that drunk. I was running from the law. I came off that drunk in a hospital in Southern Nevada Memorial Hospital. They kept me there for a couple days and shipped me over. They found out that my father, who worked for the government, kept me on his Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they shipped me over to North Las Vegas Hospital to a newly formed, a newly started alcoholism treatment center over there. And I'm, I'm a mess. I got, I'm, they got IVs in me and tubes. I'm in a bad shape. Because when you drink round the clock for oblivion, pass out, come do drink, and you don't eat, boy, I tell you, you get about two weeks of that, and you're in bad shape. And I was in bad shape. And I'm in this place, and they finally, after they got me cleaned up enough, to, they gave me some clothes because I had, my clothes were ruined. I had, had nothing to wear, and they got me some clothes. So I'd go to the A meetings, and, I, and something had happened to me. And I tell you, I didn't understand it for a long time. But I sat in those meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and for the first time in seven over seven years of attending your meetings, I actually heard you. And that, that thing that is in me, that, that judgment center, the thing that wants to pick people apart, that, that wants to tear everybody down, trying to level the playing field, you know that, that thing that just not, just, just chatters on about how screwed up everybody is? And it, that would seem to be gone temporarily. And for the first time I sat in those meetings and as you, as you shared, your experience washed over me. 
And I sat there and for the first time found myself nodding my head and thinking, my God, I'm like that. I drank like that. I felt like that. I failed like that. And yet the people I'm with, Dick T and Dino and Happy Jack and these and Rusty and these guys that bring these meetings in there, you could tell that they were something that I couldn't imagine. They were happy and sober. And I don't understand it. To me, in all the years I was exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous, AA had good news and bad news. The good news is maybe if I went to thousands of these stupid meetings, I'll stay sober the rest of my life. And the bad news, I'm going to live a long time. Because I can't imagine life without alcohol or without something. And I started to get hope. And the hope was that maybe if I did everything they did, maybe what happened for them could happen for me. And I guess that was my entrance into Alcoholics Anonymous. Being willing to do some things that I absolutely didn't believe would work. I mean, and if, if you sit, if you're a newcomer, if there's any newcomers in here, and you're sitting and you're looking at the actions in the fellowship and the 12 steps, I don't, I've never met anyone, myself included, that ever came to AA broken, looked at the steps and went, oh yeah, that would work. <laughs> I don't know anybody that's had that experience. What what happens to guys like me is I'm so desperate. I'll do stupid stuff that doesn't make any sense. I'll let the people in Alcoholics Anonymous take advantage of my weakness and do some things, and then all of a sudden I'm different. But I didn't get I didn't change easily. I I was whacked. My early sobriety, I suffered from a lot of depression. I like these mood swings up and down. I'd be really good one day, and then I'd be just, uh, I'd feel sorry for myself, and it just is bad. And I, I had a lot of manicness and anxiousness, and I didn't take anything. And I went to tw 15 or 20 meetings a week. Like I'm trying to outrun my alcoholism. I got a sponsor. I'd call him up on a regular basis with the crisis du jour, you know, and I was, it, I, he used to say this one thing to me over and over again. I said, I'd come up with some kind of panic, you know, I'd, uh, where I'm working, they don't, they don't like me and I'm going to lose my job and I, and I don't think I'm going to be able to, I'll be homeless. I don't know if I can stay so more homeless and I, and I, I think I have a brain tumor and, and you know, I just, you know, I go, I have all this cr frantic thinking, you know, this is, the book says we should avoid hysterical thinking or advice. If I'm going to avoid hysterical thinking in, new, in early sobriety, where am I going to go? I mean, I am the source of hysterical thinking. I'm like little, I would, Greg and I were talking about, I'm chicken little every day. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, right? And he would say, he would always say the same thing to me. He would, Dick would say, but is everything okay right this second? Yeah, but by next week, man, it's going to... He said, whoa, no, this second, right in this moment, is everything okay? Well, yeah, good. Let's, let's hang on to that. And I don't know what he's trying to do. He's trying to bring me, I guess, to the place, the only place a guy like me can possibly ever connect with God. Talks about in chapter 5. It says, there's one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him in a place that most of us seldom visit. Now. <laughs> even as I'm saying that, there half the people, I can tell by the look in some of your faces, you're not even here. You're thinking, what page is that on? Who can I tell that to? What's he talking about? You know, you're not even here when I'm saying that. <laughs> I, sp I sponsored a guy uh, till he, he had ended up not doing too well at the end, but for a lot of years he did very well, for about 14 years. Then he kind of got into some drugs and some other stuff and had a bad, went a bad way. But he was a brilliant guy. He was a, a scientist. He taught physics, all kinds of stuff. And I went to him one day and I said, I said, Rob, uh, what's, what do they mean in the book when they say we were rocketed into the fourth dimension? What is that? It sounds science fiction to me. He says, oh no, he says there's a fourth dimension. He said, he said one time they thought there was only three and then Einstein, some of those guys came along, thought there was four. He says, today they, some people think there's ten. I said, what's the fourth dimension? He says, well, Einstein thought it was time. He said, you have width, height, depth, and the fourth dimension is time. Well, what's that have to do with me? He says, maybe you were out of time. 
And I started to realize that if I was ever rocketed into the fourth dimension, you would hear a loud pop as my head came out of my butt and I'd actually show up in my life. And isn't that what alcohol did? Really? Do you, do you remember the early days of drinking where you could walk into a bar and you're just in your head, just locked up, worrying about tomorrow and anguishing over the things you did last night and the things you did yesterday? You're just completely disconnected from reality, completely disassociated up here. And then about five drinks, and I would show up in my life. About seven drinks, I started to care about people. Remember that thing about 10 drinks where you just loved everybody? I love you, man. Just, I'd feel a part of I'd be present. I could listen to you. You could tell me what's going on with you, and I'm with you. I'm present. I'm right there. And I feel connected to the universe. The great Carl Jung, in a letter that he wrote in the early 60s to Bill Wilson, told Bill in the letter something he was afraid to tell Roland Hazard. He said that he always believed that the alcoholic's thirst for alcohol was on a low level, a thirst for unity of his being with God. I drank alcohol to get connected to life and people. And when alcohol stopped working for me, I felt like I was dying in here. And the loneliness was overwhelming. I was disconnected from God. I was disconnected from you. And I was, in a, in a strange and peculiar sense, I was even disconnected with myself because I don't even know who I am anymore because I've tried to be so many things to so many people that I don't know who or what I am. I have no integrity. I have no oneness. I might tell you I'll do this. And when it came time to do it, I'd do something else. I was a flake. I was disconnected in all areas. And you guys started to put me back together. And one of the earliest things that people in AA hammered into me, be where you said you're going to be when you said you're going to be there. Do what you said you're going to do when you said you're going to do it. Show up where you're supposed to show up. If you tell somebody you're going to do something and it, later on you don't feel like doing it, do it anyway because you said you were going to. And you guys encouraged me to be one person, a person that does what he says he's going to do. And I started to go through the steps, but I didn't go through them quickly. I, <clears throat> I struggled with them for my first four and a half years. I did a kind of a BS version of step four in early sobriety. You know, the, the thing that, the, the mistake that most of us make, you know, the life story is a, like the combination of Freudian analysis and Catholic confession. And I subjected my sponsor to eight hours of that stuff till his eyes glazed over and he wished he had a drink, you know, and, and, and <clears throat> You know, and I got some things off my chest. I, I got rid of some secrets and stuff, but nothing really changed. And in between four and five years of sobriety, I started to suffer from untreated alcoholism. And you know, when I start suffering from untreated alcoholism into sobriety, I don't get it that it's untreated alcoholism because I've grown past that. It's got to be something. It's 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 a bad employer. It's a it's a it's lousy relations. It's it's not alcoholism. But I was suffering from alcoholism, and, and when I'm suffering from alcoholism, I, most of the time, especially in early sobriety, sometimes I get it today. But I wouldn't get it that that's what it is. When I'm suffering from alcoholism, what seems to be going on is that I'm surrounded by a lot of really out of line people. You know, some real idiots are showing up in life all of a sudden. Some people that just need straightened out. And I am the guy that is the source of my separation. I am the guy who becomes the source. The self-selfishness and self-centeredness disconnects me and isolates me from you, from God, and from life itself. And I... Uh, when I was between four and five years sober, I went back through the steps and I followed the process in the book. And I, I tell you something, I, when I, that thing on resentments, especially on the bottom of page 66 and the top of 67 changed my life. And I almost missed it after the thing when it says this was our course. I almost missed it. 
And when I was able to do that for all my resentments, what I effectually did is I dismantled the judgment machine within me that is the will. See, because I spent my first several years of sobriety daily turning my will and life over to the care of God. And what is happening is I'm, I'm not turning my will over because I don't even know what my will is. I don't know what my, I, I haven't analyzed my judgments or the things I think I'm right about and all the resentments and the fears. And all I've done is I'm turning my life over to God and retaining my will. And if you do that, what you're really retaining is your judgment of how your life should go and what's right and what's wrong. And if you retain your will and give your life to God, it's like saying, God, here's my life, but there's a list coming of how it better go. And you know what depression is? That's when God stops doing your will. And I started experiencing the anxiety of playing God and finding myself at odds with everybody around me because I'm back in the driver's seat. And the dismantling of that, and the ongoing in step 10, dismantling of that judgment process never seems to keep me surrendered completely, but it can tell you what it does do. It keeps me in the zip code. I don't know that I could ever be as surrendered as I was in that hospital in 1978 again. It was when I got down on my knees and I begged whatever was there for help. But the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsoring people and, and being involved in the fellowship seems to keep me in that zip code. It keeps me far enough away from the wheel in my life. Occasionally I get back at the wheel a little bit, and you guys, I'm surrounded by people that chips can, can stop that. Step away from your life. Stop that. <laughs> and I, uh, I have a good life today. I, uh, it's not my fault. Uh, if you're new here, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. What we really have here is a, an effective treatment for the inside malady of my spirit. And some of you may, when you hear, if you're like me and you hear people talk about alcoholism as a spiritual malady, I bristled when I heard that. Ah, that's a cop-out. That's religion. That's a... And I'll tell you what's always been true for me. When I stopped drinking, my, my spirit got depressed and withdrew and got isolated and alone. And there was a time in my life when five shots of tequila would vitalize my spirit and awaken something in me that I yearned to have awoke. And I'll tell you what I believe Alcoholics Anonymous is about. It's about the same thing. Some of our more religious members, they call it, they, they talk about it in religious terms, and those fit, but in pragmatic, everyday terms, is that something must happen to me so that I can be a part of you, or else the loneliness of abstinence will drive me back to, to deluding myself one more time that some sort of drug or drink or something is going to be a treatment for this disease one more time. And I'm one who believes if I live with untreated alcoholism long enough, insane things start looking like a good idea. There's many of us in this room that have had some dear, dear friends take their own lives with many years of sobriety. And I, I think, I believe that if, if I'm like them, that could happen to me. And so I get up in the morning, I think about the 24 hours ahead, I constructively review my plans for the day. I talked about to God about the things that are my handicaps, and I asked him to get rid of them so that I can go out and come closer to carrying out that decision I made in step three, which is really a decision about trying to make my life none of my business and help God's kids. I, have, I do not believe that Alcoholics Anonymous is a self-help program. I don't believe it was ever intended to be that way. I think it's a program of self-abandonment and service. That there is something about a guy like me who has this malady of my spirit that my very best concerted obsessive efforts to make me whole and happy and the end result 
is sometimes I wished I was dead. That I am an absolute failure, not only at drinking, but I am a failure at fixing Bob. And I'll tell you, I don't know a group of people on the planet that has made, that has spent more money, time, obsessive energy trying to make ourselves happier than we have. And the end result, some of us wished we were dead. That I get it. That I can't manage this stuff. I can't fix me. So I will be about my father's business. And a funny thing happens to guys like me as I abandon myself of my life and just kind of, let's put it over here. And not when I'm saying that, I don't mean not to respond to the next thing that's indicated, but the future, the plans, the designs, the, the whole deal. Put it over here, and I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to make those amends. I'm going to help God's kids. I'm going to go down to the detox. I'm going to go on 12-step calls. I'm going to answer. I'm going to return that phone call, because that's what members of Alcoholics Anonymous do. We return phone calls. Because you ne- because I never know when God might have me call, had somebody call me. And I do all of that, and it seems, my, my experience is as I've left my life alone, God seems to come in and do something in me that I could never do in myself. I'll um, tell you a quick little story, and I'll end. I was up in uh, Northern California years ago, in, I don't know, 15, 17, 18 years ago, I guess. I don't know. And I was uh, hit this monthly deal up there, and I... Uh, after it was over, I had this whole day kind of just to do nothing, and this guy's showing me around, and he, he takes me to this place. This is up near the Oregon border. He takes me to this place where there's these trees that are like unlike anything I've ever seen. Some of these trees are two, God, 250, 300 feet high, 25, 30 feet in diameter. They're just incredible. I walked around this, this forest, and I felt small. I felt like I was in Jurassic Park or something, and it was magnificent. We get back in the guy's truck after a while and we're driving to go look at some more trees and we're going by these meadows. And he says to me, he says, you notice that there's none of those big trees standing all by themselves in the meadow. I said, yeah. He says, you know why that is? I said, no, why is that? He says, well, it is their nature to aspire to grow to such magnificent heights that they easily outgrow their roots' capacity to support them, and they literally topple over on their own magnificence. He said, what must happen for them to survive with their basic nature is they must grow up in community, and they intertwine and interweave their roots into a net below the floor of the forest and literally feed and hold each other up And that community allows them to grow into their nature. And I thought then, as I think today, how like Alcoholics Anonymous that is. You see, one of the, my, my basic defects of character has been this chronic malcontent, this dissatisfaction, this, this drive to want to take bigger bites out of life and want more and want to feel more and experience more and have more and more. This, this is, as, as father Ed Dowling told Bill Wilson, he called it divine dissatisfaction. And it wasn't until I came to you and intertwined my life with yours, that this thing that drove me stopped killing me. And as a result of, of being a part of you, you've allowed me to grow into my nature and I, I, if I live a hundred more years, I will never be able to repay you for the life I have today. When I, when I see my daughter as she came, we had a party up at my house today and there was a bunch, bunch of dear friends there. And, and I saw my daughter come in with her boyfriend and she's got that look in her eye like she's proud to see her dad. And she's a good kid. And she's never seen, she's 18 years old. She's a freshman in, in college and she's never, never seen me drink. And I, with God willing, the help of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and people like you, she never will. Thank you for my life. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.